Screen Time Stories is presented by Pinwheel. Pinwheel reimagined the smartphone experience to support healthy child development, and therapists backed the design. By removing web browsers and social media, promoting focus and intention through the interface, and curating dozens of apps to promote wellness, Pinwheel helps children develop healthy, lifelong boundaries with technology. I'm Julie, and as a parent, I'm sometimes overwhelmed by the challenge of raising my kids in the age of screens. Embracing technology and modern parenting is a must. Our kids will log on whether we like it or not. So let's lean into the challenges and joys of parenting with tech while we learn from the latest research and experts in the field. This is Screen Time Stories, parenting techniques for raising tech natives. Let's figure this out together. Today we're diving into the world of social media, a topic so contentious that it came under fire in the March 1st State of the Union Address. To help me get a better handle on this topic, I'm talking to Shelly Delane, chief mom at Pinwheel and actual mom to a nine-year-old daughter. Then I'll chat with Dr. Mike Brooks, a licensed psychologist and dad of three boys. Before we move into those conversations, let's take a broad look at kids and social media. I'm referring to any platform that lets users make and share content with users online. For example, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, just to name a handful. The Boston Children's Hospital's Digital Wellness Lab outlines the top risks, benefits, and best practices when it comes to kids using social media. If you're not familiar with our partners at the Digital Wellness Lab, we highly recommend their research. We need to tell our kids about the primary risks found on social media, their privacy, digital footprint, exposure to sexual predators, trolls and cyber bullies, and identity theft. It's important that your kids are aware of these risks before they sign up for any social media account. Let's break this down. Tell them that their privacy is non-existent, even if their account is set to private, and could become a part of their identity online or digital footprint. Tell them that sexual predators leverage social media sites to communicate with children. Remind them not to feed the trolls. It's a frustrating waste of time. And have an in-depth conversation on cyberbullying, humbly recognizing that your kid might potentially act as the cyberbully one day. Listed out like that, social media seems like an intimidating area to parent, but just keep in mind that there are obvious reasons that social sites are so popular. They can deliver positive experiences, improve family relationships, community engagement, connections with peers, and even creativity. A common sense media study showed that some teens on social media reported feeling less shy, more outgoing, more confident, more popular, more sympathetic, and felt better about themselves. Social platforms give kids an added opportunity to connect with their family, their immediate community, and peers around the world which allows kids to experience broad types of diversity firsthand. Also, social media might boost a child's creativity as they create and share artwork and stories. If you think your child is ready for a social account, first check the terms of service to make sure they're old enough. Many sites require a minimum age of 13. Then research the platform your child is interested in and talk to them about the specific risks they'll be exposed to. Set up their account together and let them know you'll keep an eye on their account by logging in with their credentials that you just created. Connect with them from your social account. And last, make sure they know how and when to block other users and to always come to you for advice if something seems even slightly off. Let's chat with Shelly Delane now. I invited Shelly to share her research and firsthand experiences with parenting in the age of social media. I appreciate her perspective because she understands this world personally and professionally. Shelly is a single mom to a nine-year-old daughter. She's presented for South by Southwest and TEDx. She's the chief mom at Pinwheel, collaborating with organizations like the Digital Wellness Lab. A major part of her job is researching the effects of technology on children and then applying that research to positively impact the real world. Shelly, when did you first think about social media's impact on your own family? So when I was pregnant with my daughter, I had a thought when I went to share, like 
an early like sonogram image even. I almost went to share that on Facebook and I had this sudden thought like, wait, do I want to share my child on social media? How much of my child do I want to share on social media? What is her social media relationship going to be like over the course of her life? And I had this dream because pregnancy does that. I had this dream that night that I posted a picture of her on Facebook in diapers. And years later, when she had her own child, Facebook fed her an image along with an ad saying, choose Pampers. Your mom chose them for you. (laughs) That's creepy. (laughs) And I was horrified and didn't want to feed that data into the machine. So that was literally like that dream, like totally shifted my view on what do I want her social media presence to be like from day one. So social media and kids is something I've been thinking about since then. And then when my daughter was, oh, about a year old or so, we had moved into a house in a subdivision that was on a street corner. And it happened to be the street corner where the local middle school bus picked up. And my daughter was fascinated with school buses. So every morning, our little ritual was to wake up and we would run to the window and watch the middle school kids wait for the bus. And then the bus would pick them up and that would be, you know, and then we would go eat breakfast or whatever it was that the rest of our day was going to contain. And as I do, I watch people and I watched these kids and I noticed one day that one kid had a brand new pair of tennis shoes, brand new white pair of tennis shoes. The next day, the kid he usually stood closest to also had white tennis shoes. By the end of like two weeks later, every kid in that group had white tennis shoes. And then the kid who had worn them first stopped wearing them. And everybody went back to having different shoes. And just that observation, along with like hundreds of other little like interactions that those kids had while waiting for the bus, led me to this whole just deep dive into how does middle school work and how does social comparison work? And how do these kids like decide what's cool and what's not cool and what's in style and what's not in style? And how does that affect social dynamics? And then as social media has started to take more of a presence in kids' lives, it just amps it up to such a degree. It's so fascinating. But like, I don't know, watching the spread of the white tennis shoes ebb and flow was also a pivotal moment. How would you say that relates to social media? Watching the single kid with the white tennis shoes sort of spreads into the rest of the group. Well, it's the same that like when there's, you know, when you've got kids that are on TikTok and there's a TikTok challenge. And so this thing gets issued and then other people start to do it and the ripples start to happen because somehow this person said it and these people took up on it. Mm -hmm. And just the degree to which kids follow along with things without even being aware of really why. Because if you were to ask any of those kids, most of them would probably have said, I just felt like getting a new pair of white shoes. They're not consciously following. They just do it. And social media, like you see it, you see it happen so much, like especially with the TikTok challenges has been a big thing that you notice. And like when they did the the whole story not long ago about the TikTok ticks, the girls who are having like literal facial ticks. And they say that shouldn't be able to be caused by just witnessing it on social media, but there you have it. They do it anyway. It's just the way kids are wired, especially yeah. in middle school. Like it's when they start to shift from what is my identity as a member of my family to what is my identity as part of the wider world. And in that, they look to their peers and their friends and the 
people around them and they start to mimic and then they reject and then they try on and then they, you know, and social media just gives them such an infinite world of people who are not even in their presence, but other people to imitate. And one thing I did want to mention just because it's, it so struck me last week. I'm currently reading Brene Brown's most recent book, The Atlas of the Heart. Have you read it? I haven't read it yet. I can't wait. Just came out so good. <laughs> Love Brene. Anyway, in Atlas of the Heart, Brene Brown is talking about, in one of the chapters, she's talking about social comparison. And she's not even speaking about it specifically in terms of children or specifically in terms of social media. But just this thing that humans are inherently wired to do, which is we see another person and there's part of our brain that instinctively and subconsciously compares how we relate to them. Are they higher status than we are? Are we higher status than they are? Are we the same? Are we different? Are we this? Are we that? Like, what are we relative to each other? that there's this whole part of the human brain that does that subconsciously and that it can be made more conscious, like we can become more conscious of it. And she was talking in this chapter about how excessive social comparison almost inevitably leads to anxiety and depression and negative emotional spirals. That the more you do social comparison, the worse the impact is. And that just struck me so much because one of the factors in that too that makes social comparison even more impactful is when you're not solid in your own identity and relationship with yourself. And if there's anything we know about kids is they're still learning who they are in the real world, they're still learning their own identities. And so when they engage in an environment where it's entirely focused on social comparison, it's entirely focused on social comparison and social comparison with people who are presenting the best part of themselves. So it's not even real, but they're people who are presenting is all shiny and you've got kids who are comparing themselves to that. And of course, it's going to lead to anxiety and depression and all of those things because that's what that does. So tell me more about how social comparison presents itself in social media. Oh gosh, there's a whole world of that about how social comparison presents itself in social media. And probably but, different between each platform too. Well, it's different between each platform, but it's also different between ages and stages too. Like Lisa Damore talks about it a good bit in Untangled, the book, her book on um, adolescent female development. She speaks to it well. Uh, and there's a couple of other books that do too, talking about how kids encode messages to their friends. Like a girl might post a picture of herself wearing a college sweatshirt and to anyone else, it's just a picture of a girl wearing a college sweatshirt. But to her closest friends, that might telegraph, I got the acceptance letter I was waiting for. And of course, you've got like the like button. If, oh, yeah. you know, if this chick has 70 likes and I've only got three, yep. <laughs> was it not a cute picture? Was it, you know, yes. am I not and as popular as she is? Yes. 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 All the second guessing. All the second guessing. And you liked these three things of mine. Why didn't you like that one? What is it? that mean and all the meaning that kids attach to the likes or the not likes or the speed of the likes or the why this person responded to these things and not that thing these spin themselves into craziness I don't want my concerns about social media to come across as being anti-social media because I also am in awe of some of the things that young people do now because of social media, like the empathy they have for people in other parts of the world and the ability they have to organize things or to connect with people that in their small town, they might never have found anyone else who had an interest in 14th century French poetry, but, or whatever, but like, because of the power of social media and 
the web, they can connect with people that they have common interests in and not feel alone in the world. And like, there really are some beautiful and powerful things about that for the new generation. It's important to acknowledge that social media does provide benefits because just like any type of news, the sweet stories don't typically make the first page. It's great that our kids can do things like share updates with extended family and strengthen relationships with teammates and kids from school, but there is a rollout process that's crucial to kids staying safe and healthy. If parents are disengaged, their kid might face some awful experiences. Do you know what I mean? Parental involvement and awareness is important on all of the things because like With Discord, there's a lot of kids who use Discord as a platform that's convenient for talking on when they're playing games, and it does have some functionality that no other platform really does. Like, it does actually handle voice calls and texting at the same time better than almost anything else out there, which drives me a little crazy because... Things happen on that platform that should not be part of any kid's upbringing. Like there was an incident recently where came to my attention. There's a kid who's on Discord and the agreement with their parents is that she only stay on the private server where she's only talking to known friends and talking about games that they're currently playing. That's the agreement. That's what her parents believe was happening. And because she plays games that also have the gamers play on YouTube, they do live play and broadcast it on YouTube. And she saw one of her favorite YouTubers had a promotional thing where they said, come to our Discord server and you might get invited to our live play session. And so she went and joined that public server on Discord because there's no parental control preventing her. It's an honor system and she's younger. I don't want to give any personally identifying information here, but she's under 10, we'll put it that way. So this girl goes and joins this public server And almost immediately, like within her first session of being on that server, some guy sends her a direct message or some person sends her a direct message and says, if you send me a picture of your body, I can get you on the live play server. Without even hesitating, she sent him a picture of her butt because it didn't occur to her that that was going to be a problem and she wanted to get on the server. And as a mom, like, I find it heartbreaking and terrifying once a kid complies with a request for naked images of themselves, that can escalate real quick and get really traumatizing really fast. And on a platform like Discord, there's no visibility. Her parents, unless she tells her parents or someone else tells them, they don't know what's happened. There's no record of it. She's deleted it. There's no way for them to see it, for them to know about it, for them to help her with it. Any of those things, it's invisible. And so you've got a kid who's not even old enough to walk to the store by herself, who's complying with a request a stranger sent her to send a naked picture because she doesn't know not to. One of the statistics that literally made me nauseous the first time I read it And that when I went looking into it, I had to read about it in small bits over the course of a few days because I couldn't digest it all at once. That estimates are that something like 33% of the child pornography online is created by the children in it at home with one or more parents in the other room. Sex trafficking can be entirely virtual now. Kids get paid by Venmo, by gift cards. They literally get paid for sexually exploiting themselves on camera. And the majority of that is 11 to 14 year old girls. And parents don't even know what's happening until their kid comes to them and is so anxious or depressed. And it started with, well, you sent me this picture. Now you have to send me more. Mm -hmm. And if you 
don't, I am going to hunt you down and kill your parents. And if you tell them, I will kill them. Like it's classic grooming. It's just, it's so efficient. When it comes to social media and the dangers that exist out there, how are we supposed to handle this as parents? Because it's overwhelming. What you want is a kid who, if they get anything unexpected on a device, that they'll come to you and tell you about it. It's your best defense against anything because software won't catch everything. The platforms aren't set up for visibility. Like the tech is not designed to help a parent do this job. How do you but, keep that line of communication open so that it's hard? The reaction to your kids stumbling across something like porn is really hard to, you know, have a conversation after that. Like, how do we handle that when our kid says, I just saw something that I wasn't expecting to see? I like, I want to make sure that I'm talking to my kids in a way that makes them feel comfortable talking to me again and again and again in the future. So what is the proper response when, when they come to us? Gratitude first. Yeah. Gratitude first. Like always, like no matter what it is, like don't even let yourself process like what it is first. As soon as they come to you and say, I came across this thing, like first response always. Oh my God, thank you for coming to me. Let's take a look at it. Like, thank you for telling me. Let's look at it then look <laughs> because if you have the horrified gross out reaction first, like they feel that yeah. and they know. So like, I literally, like, I don't even look at it first. I'm like, thank you. Thank you for telling me. And I usually hug her and I'm like, okay, let's deal with it. Whatever it is. And always come from the assumption that whatever it is, they didn't go looking for it on purpose. Like they're not trying to horrify you. They're not trying, like they clicked on something accidentally. They got served something up. They got curious about something and didn't realize what that was going to lead them into. Um, there's all kinds of reasons, but I think assuming good intent is also a really helpful thing in that arena. So, and I, I think just the word curiosity is a really strong point when it comes to kids not intending to go down certain YouTube rabbit holes, for example. They're just curious little humans. They're growing, they're learning. And so they're going to Google things and that turns into more things. That's how kids learn is by experimenting and learning. So that's how that goes. And they end up in some dark places. So yeah, my guiding principles have always been gratitude when she comes to me and then assuming good intent that she didn't mean for that thing to come up and understanding that she's just exploring. It's not, it's not on purpose. But then the third thing that I keep in mind always is I treat the device like a doorway to the whole world. That if my daughter is on that device, she's leaving the house and she's going out into the world. And so, like, I treat it like, who's going to be there? And what does she need to know to navigate safely there? And can she get back okay? And what time is she going to be back? And, like, all of the things that I do to prepare before she goes over for a play date or going to somebody's house, we talk about those things before she gets on whatever device she's going to be using. And then when she gets back, we have a conversation about how was it? Yeah. Who'd you play with? What'd you do? How'd it go? Because in her mind, she did enter a different world. Yeah. That makes sense. I think I'll adopt the gratitude and innocence approach when my kids come to me with issues. But what if they don't come to me? What if I'm the one that comes across something off limits? Shelly says that it's key to have that line of communication already open and for us as parents to tell our kids what we saw and ask them about it. When we find something upsetting, get your feelings out before approaching your child. Talk to a friend or therapist, write it down, scream into a pillow, whatever gets you centered. When you're ready to talk, start with empathy and truly listen to what they have to say, making a point to understand their situation before addressing it. 
staying calm and non-reactive during this conversation will open doors for uncomfortable conversations in the future. Taking long, slow breaths can help you through this conversation. Once you understand where they're coming from, it's okay to put the conversation on pause to consider everything. Set a day and time that you'll revisit the conversation. You can take away their device as an act of protection or to simply reduce distraction while you both process what happened. You might consult a professional if you're overwhelmed, but don't leave your kid in silence during the interim period. Remind them that you love them and that you want their brains and hearts to not hold on to this trauma. When you're ready to revisit the conversation, let your kid know exactly what boundaries they crossed. Decide on an approach that solves for the actual problem and makes expectations more clear going forward. Keep in mind, though, if it was a matter of technology baiting or luring, working against them, don't punish them for that unfairly. Changing gears now, Shelly, how could social media define a young person? Because the way identity forms in kids is by seeing how mom reacts, how their classmates react how their teachers react, how real people in real space react is what helps kids form their identity and who they choose and how they choose to show up in the world. But when they're going through that process in the invisible space of social media and what they're getting is, if I do this, ooh, I got a lot of likes. That must mean this is a socially valid thing to do. Once a kid gets to be a teenager, some time on social media can be entertaining and it can connect them with the wider world. And like there can be all these benefits to it. But what you want to make sure is one, that you're aware of it. So they're not putting on an identity that's totally counter to anything you're aware of. And two, you want to know that they have a sense of who they are Mm -hmm. before going into that realm. Like, It's very different if a kid goes into that realm and they're clear, like, this is who I am. This is what I want in my life. This is how I want to be in the world. This is who I am versus let me figure out who to be based on what people like in the web. That's not a healthy way to form an identity. Thank you, Shelly. That's powerful to recognize that our kids might create an identity based on the responses they get from people online who only see a curated fraction of their lives. I'm so thankful for your insight on this, and I know it'll help ease my parenting challenges. Next, we're chatting with Dr. Mike Brooks, a licensed psychologist and licensed specialist in school psychology. He's worked in a variety of settings, including schools, community, mental health agencies, hospitals, residential treatment centers, mostly with kids and up. He lives in Austin with his wife and three boys, ages 10 to 18. Dr. Brooks, how did you get into this niche in the medical field? I got interested in screens and how they affect us from the very beginning, like my generation ushered in video games. So they had me at Hello playing Space Invaders and Asteroids and Centipede and Donkey Kong and all the arcade classics. I spent a large part of my youth at arcades and played the home games too, although they pale in comparison to today's games. I did my dissertation research on the effect of video game violence on kids. And as I got into the private practice realm, I was presenting at schools on this, but then what became a hot topic is tech addiction. So one thing led to another and I ended up writing a book that was um, released by Oxford University Press. It's called Tech Generation, Raising Balanced Kids in a Hyperconnected World that came out uh, just a couple years ago. And so I, have been presenting even more about uh, technology and its effects on people, but I'm more broadly interested in well-being. And so within that larger umbrella, I find, you know, how are screens affecting our well-being? But I, you know, and I I present a lot about well-being in a more general sense, like how to live a more balanced life, life satisfaction, dealing with anxiety, stress, depression, relationship issues, those sorts of things. Yep, nothing wrong with a bowl of ice cream after a balanced dinner, but some kids are more prone to spooning it straight from the container in the middle of the night than others. When people say, well, you know, social media or TikTok or whatever, they're bad for kids. And it's like, well, 
I think it might be more the case that, you know, it's Snapchat isn't necessarily bad for kids, but Snapchatting at 1 a.m. At a, on a school night, that's what's the problem, you know, is, uh, that inherently to social media, it isn't always bad, but or usually not bad, but it's so easy to slip into responding too much and getting caught up in checking and and then it's they're not working as productively on their homework and stuff like that and i see those it's a little bit like death by a thousand cuts you know it's it's not for most teens that they're doing egregious things on social media but kind of the overconsumption just like americans we kind of eat too many calories and even too much of a good thing isn't good. So even when social media is generally positive and they're chatting with their friends and harmless enough and talking about homework or whatever, but then they're, you know, not interacting with their family. They're not going to see their friends in person because they're Snapchatting or they're staying up too late Snapchat. Those are the kind of things that I think add up to it being a problem in a more pervasive insidious way. So keeping a balance means that our kids shouldn't displace healthy activities with social media. That's called the displacement hypothesis is it's not what we're doing with our screens is what we're not doing by being on our screens. That's the greater problem. So sleeping, getting exercise, going outdoors, seeing friends in person, you know, that sort of thing. Every generation has a moral panic about what the younger generation is doing. Like when books, literacy first came on the scene, there were many educated people who thought it was a horrible idea that the average person would be able to read like the Bible or other books. They're like, oh my God, it's going to be chaos. Newspapers, radio, telephones, television, video games, comic books, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, you go on and on. Every older generation looks at what the younger generation is doing and goes, oh my God, they're going to hell in a handbasket. It's a challenge. And it's also not to say that some kids don't really suffer from screens because they do, you know, they get into stuff and they get bullied and stuff. But if you aggregate all the data and you say, is the average teenager suffering a lot because of their screen use? The answer is no. Or social media use? The answer is no. Now, if we say do some, yes. So I would say there's a subset of vulnerable population that we need to be more concerned. So it's not either or, it's a both and. That's an interesting parallel that books caused panic and so does social media. I agree, but I think it's also important to recognize that social media is designed to suck kids in, which is why books collect dust and smartphones don't. (laughs) If I think my kid is ready for a social account, is there a right way to introduce it? You know, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but I think there are some better ways than others. And one is, you know, it doesn't have to be all or none and that you need to have conversations with your your kid on the front end about what does responsible use look like? What are the do's and don'ts? And I'm a nerd and I'll take this from Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. And a smartphone is a very powerful thing. So I don't think, yeah, it'd be foolish just to say, hey, you just turned 13, here's a smartphone. You know, (laughs) I'd say that's not the way to do it. What I tell parents though is, I think one of the problems that has happened is parents focus more on the phone and not the relationship. Rules without relationship equals rebellion. So the first thing, and this is in my model in the um, tech generation, it would call it the tech happy life model, is it's like a pyramid with four stages, four parts, and the foundation of it is the relationship. So before you get to the rules and even the discussion is you have to work on the relationship with your your kid. The stronger the relationship you have, the more leverage you'll have as a parent, you know, to uh, talk about the rules, have open discussions, to set limits, consequences, all those things. If you don't have a relationship or it's very conflictual, the smartphone is going to reflect that 
dysfunctional relationship. And then what parents I find tend to do is they focus on the phone and social media. They don't look at the underlying issues with their relationship, you know, and certainly it, it can throw a big curveball with the uh, smartphone and social media. But I think relationship first and then having uh, the others role modeling, you know, as parents, they're looking to us. So we can't like be eating a bag of cheesy poofs and tell them to eat the carrot sticks. So there's almost as many teens view their parents as addicted to their phones as parents view the teens. So they're watching us. If we can't put down our own devices, we can't expect them to be able to put them down and and respect boundaries. It doesn't have to be all or none. You know, it could be that they have a staggered approach that they only get one, you know, first they get a smartphone, then a little later down the line, they get social media Maybe it's only one social media. Um, And if they're using it responsibly, then we uh, give them more access. You know, we increase what we allow and they gain more privileges. But then if they're using it irresponsibly, we can step in and kind of restrict them or something until they show that they're being able to use it responsibly. So you're saying I sometimes need to put down the cheesy puffs, my phone. If I don't want my kids to see me as a hypocrite. Wrapping up here, help me decide. On a scale of one to crying in my closet, how worried should I feel about my kids getting their first social media account? What I would say is, and especially as they get older, is teens want to do well in life. They want to succeed. They want good grades. They want to be well-liked. They you know, want to go to college, whatever, be successful. And when their screen time is too much, it only becomes too much when it's starting to cause harm. So here's a distinction I wanna make clear, and this is related. There's a difference between ideal and optimal and harmful. So oftentimes as parents, we look at our kids on our phone, on their phones or playing Minecraft and like Fortnite and you're like, Why don't you go build a fort outside with your friends instead of playing Fortnite on the screen all the time? What we're often saying is we wish our kids would be doing something better with their time. Now, that may be true. And I look back to growing up watching Happy Days and Gilligan's Island and Brady Bunch and a lot of other mindless TV and shot so many Space Invaders that it was probably a colossal waste of neurons in my brain. (laughs) Maybe I could be playing classical guitar right now or fluent in three other languages, but that doesn't mean that screen time of my youth harmed me. I missed out on some things, which is different. So when it's too much, what I would have conversations, especially with teens, but you can start even younger is, What do you want with grades? What are your goals? So instead of a parent imposing what they want to see in their kids top down from a top down perspective is kids want to succeed. We shouldn't preempt our kids own goals for themselves by telling them what they should be doing. Talk to them. What does success look like for you? What grades would you be happy with? How would you know if you were using too much screen time? What would that look like? So now we're having a conversation and they call this collaborative problem solving. So instead of this power differential of a top down, we are trying to get it from our kids, what they want and what their goals are for them. So if we, from a top down perspective, are regulating it all for them, they don't learn that skill of self-regulation, self-monitoring. And that's like the the holy grail that we want when our kids go off to college, we're not going to be there, you know, over their shoulder. And if they played Fortnite or Counter-Strike the whole time, or just were on Instagram the whole time in their lectures, you know, we want them to learn that while they're under our roof. And if we do it all for them, they're not going to learn that important life skill. 
it's actually comforting to interact with my kids from the stance that they want to succeed. Of course they do. I want to remember that when they do make a mistake, I need to bring gratitude and curiosity to the conversation. No different than the way I want to be treated after I make a mistake. Thank you, Dr. Brooks, for helping us find a healthy grasp on parenting in the age of social media. And thanks to Shelly Delane for providing her personal and professional views. Thanks to you for listening. Let me know what challenge with technology your family is facing by emailing me at julie at pinwheel.com. We'll share a new episode next week on how we can role model good tech behaviors to our kids.